things, and that's how it goes. Um, my thing's supposed to start at 10.45, right? Yeah, and it's 10.50. So we're going to get started, <laughs> and we'll just fool around with this later. Um, so my name is Beth um, Four Acre. I'm a mom of four kids. And I have a 25-year-old who's a grad student at UC Irvine. Um, I have a, his name's Jack. I have a 23-year-old whose name is Mary Kate. She's up at Oregon Health Sciences University becoming a nurse. I have a 19-year-old son whose name is Patrick. He's a freshman in college at George Mason University. And he has Down syndrome. And I have a seventh grader whose name is Caroline who's 12. She's the only one hanging out with us right now. So we have a very quiet house and a puppy <laughs> to make it better. Um, anyway, so this is going to be a story of our journey to find a, a college for Patrick, our son. My real life, aside from being a mom, I'm an educator. I've been a classroom teacher for, since 1987. I got my teaching credential from UC Davis and my undergrad from UC Davis. After Patrick was born, he needed open heart surgery right away, so I took a leave of absence and um, was gone from the classroom for seven years because in that time he also got leukemia, which is really terrible. Um, but turns out with a lot of research and um, smart people and collaboration, a lot of leukemia, childhood leukemia can be cured. Um, so that was a three year long process for him. So I was gone out of the classroom for seven years. Then I ended up getting a job with UC Davis being a supervisor of beginning teachers. Um, and that's what I've been doing for the last 12 years. So I supervise um, beginning teachers. I go into the classroom, I watch them teach, and I give them feedback on their teaching. I'm in districts all over the Davis area. About, we have about 16 districts we work with. And then I get to teach a seminar on student teaching. But my night job, my passion, is full inclusion. And my son was fully included kindergarten through 12th grade. The first um, nine years of his education, he was included in a Catholic school, our local Catholic school. So I run a nonprofit. I founded and run a nonprofit that's called the National Catholic Board on Full Inclusion. That board um, works to help. What it first does, it has two prongs to its advocacy. The first prong is to stand with families so they can knock on the door of their local parish school and not feel so alone. And the second is once that school says yes, we offer mentors um, for free at all levels, experts in disability, particular disabilities, um, and classroom teachers, administrators, priests, superintendents, you name it. We have all these people who will mentor you for free because they have been part of an inclusive Catholic school and they know how transformative it is. It was completely transformative for our Catholic school in Davis and be, everybody became better teachers, which we know. You, I'm with the group probably who all knows that, but anyway. Um, so he was welcomed K through eight, he you know, made all his sacraments. He, um, learned, he learned to read really well because he had what I call a scientist of reading for his first grade teacher. She was not warm and fuzzy, but she knew how to teach people how to read. And uh, he learned how to read. She was super mad, it was so funny. At the end of first grade. <laughs> Still missing a little bits. Okay, okay good, <laughs> that sounds about right. <laughs> Yeah, no problem. Uh, we'll All just right. deal with that. Roll it's with okay. It. Yeah. Um, I'll go back to that in a minute. Anyway, this first grade teacher's name is Mrs. Thompson. I always give her a shout out. But at the end of first grade, she said, um, yeah, I would said, Mrs. Thompson, he's reading. This is so amazing. He's like such a good reader. She's like, I'm so mad he's not level 16 because 16 was where she got all her students. 16 is a boxcar kids, like a full, you know, real novel. So that's where Mrs. Thompson was. But what was great was she, she looked at Patrick as a challenge to her. You know, I know how to teach reading. Can I teach reading to Patrick? And when she saw him really reading, it was like, oh, wow, I can really start taking him forward. All right, I'm going to go back to my beginning here. Oh, there's Patrick. And you, you'll just forgive our mixed up slides now. They should be good on yours. But this is Patrick's high school graduation picture. Um, 
So 30 years ago, you guys know, only 20% of students with intellectual disabilities were educated in a public school. Now we have 95%, which is great. Um, but we still have a long way to go. Only 17% are fully included across our nation. Um, only 41% will get a regular class high school diploma. Patrick did do that. Um, and only 15% get competitive integrated employment. Um, so we can connect the two dots. If you're fully included, the chances for a good employment are pretty strong. Um, Okay, so he was fully included. Oh, I I'm just going to tell you about this picture because anybody who loves someone with a disability. So I have these two older kids. So when it was time for them to take their, you know, these, this is like your yearbook picture. When it was time for them to do that, they drove themselves to the thing. They took the picture, blah, blah. Patrick can't drive, so I had to drive him. So I take him there. Well, it turns out there were other parents like lurking around. I didn't know that. <laughs> so I'm lurking around. And so the guy's like, oh, you need to come take a picture. I'm like, what? I'm not taking pictures it's for the yearbook. He's like, no, no, it's always the best picture. I'm wearing my shorts in the summer. So um, he's like, really, just do this. Trust me. So I did that. Now I'm so mad. I let my old Jack and Mary Kate do this. So poor Caroline, I'm going to be one of those lurkers. My seventh <laughs> grader, I'm going to be like, I'm lurking around for that cute picture. So it pays to have someone with a disability. All right, so let me just go back. Um, they call graduation for kids with intellectual disabilities from high school falling off the cliff. And it really feels like that. You can feel the cliff coming. What is going to happen to your kid? Where are they going? What does their adulthood look like? No one else is talking to you about this. Even though the school district, if you're graduating with a diploma, you're done with the district. They're, you're not going to be hanging out till 21. If you're going to be hanging out till you're 21, what happens after 21? You're still going to have a cliff. And it feels really terrible. So we felt that all year long. Um, Patrick a little bit felt that, but my husband and I were just like, what does this look like afterwards? <clears throat> so because I had had two other kids and I'd gone through the college process of finding a college for them and talking with them about college, we just kind of approached it the same way, like we're going to look at these colleges and see, see what they offer. So when he was a junior, we started to look at these college programs. Um, Patrick, in his world, because he had seen Jack and Mary Kate go off to college, he, this wasn't a crazy idea to him. Um, so I'm really sad that this isn't working, but you guys need to know about Think College if you don't know about it. Think College is a clearinghouse of information about college programs for students with intellectual disabilities. There are over 250 college programs in the United States. Only 16 of those are four-year programs with inclusive living. So we have a lot more programs to build. Zero four-year programs are in, the, in California, okay? So in 2015, our federal government awarded grants. They're called TIPSID grants, 48 were awarded. This is federal funding to build these programs. Currently, we still have TIPSID federal funding. That is on the table, of course, to be cut with our current administration. So if you care about inclusive college programs, you can reach out to your local people and let them know. Um, this is the map that is on Think College about how many college programs are available at each state. If you look in California, it says we have 17 programs. Most of those programs are at community colleges. So your student with an intellectual disability would be allowed to go to a community college and supported in some way at the community college. But there's no inclusive living, there's no inclusive community, there's no real moving into independence because you're still driving them to the community college or maybe they're taking Uber or something, but they're still with you at home. Um, only two of the 17 programs offer housing in California. One is at Fresno State, 
They have a fantastic program. It's a fully inclusive, really beautiful program with inclusive living. It's really awesome, but it's only two years long. And then UCLA has uh, a program, but um, we'll talk about that later. <laughs> Since I'm being videoed, we'll, we'll talk on the download. Um, we have Idaho um, and Oklahoma, when this map was made, said they had no programs. This coming year, this year, 2018, they each have now one program on. So we currently only have one state in the United States that has zero programs, and that still is West Virginia. These are the 16 programs across the United States that offer four years with inclusive living. I'm going to read them out to you because they're hard to know their graphics. Um, we have the University of Arkansas, the University of Northern Colorado, Georgia Tech, Missouri State, um, the College of New Jersey, Clemson University, Kent State, University of Cincinnati, College of Charleston, Southeastern University, George Mason University, Millersville University, University of Northern Florida, Elmhurst College, and University of North Carolina, Greensboro. As you can tell, none in the West, none in California. California has 36 million citizens. We have one million people with intellectual disabilities in our state. At least 10,000 of those people are between the ages of 18 and 25 with nowhere to go. So it is really imperative that we build these programs in our state. I'm so sorry this is messed up, but I just want to give you a little taste of um, what college, college programs look like. So the College of Charleston is a four-year program with four-year living, inclusive living. How are you going to do that? Are you just going to drop your kid off with autism or Down syndrome at this college and say bye-bye? I mean, that feels uncomfortable. How can you feel safe doing this? Well, they are very intentional, very strategic programs. They're not going to just say, here you are, College of Charleston, bye-bye. In order, when you get to Charleston, right off the bat, your student is paired up with a person and you, they have 50 steps to freedom. That means that the, your child will be paired up and learn 50 different routes across campus with this person, all across campus. They will not leave that person's side until they know all 50 routes. That, so that they can walk them independently and confidently. Sometimes that takes three days to learn. Sometimes it takes three months. The College of Charleston doesn't care. They want your child to feel supported and confident and capable. So, they are, so right off the bat, your child is going to navigate the campus with support. They, every single course, I think this is so powerful. I work at UC Davis, like I told you. Every single course that's offered at the College of Charleston is accessible to a, they're called REACH students, College of Charleston REACH student. All of their faculty is on board. Why are they on board? Their program is about um, 10 years old. They've had their program since 2008. Because the teaching gets better. We know this as inclusive educators. When you include the most difficult student you have to get better in your teaching. And these teachers, these professors, have seen what has happened to their own teaching. So every course is accessible. Um, they have peer mentors. So other College of Charleston students that are mentor you for academics. They have exercise and nutrition mentors. They have social uh, inclusion mentors. Every single semester, they have a paid job either on campus, at first it begins on campus, or off campus. And then, of course, they begin to budget their money as they're paid. So when they're paid, then they start um, making their, you know, purchasing choices on their own with their own money that they've earned. Um, student interest is supported and encouraged. And then, obviously, if you're living with other people, your, in, your life skills start to really be meaningful. They're in context, and you start to become an independent liver. 
Um, so that is what it looks like at the College of Charleston. So George Mason is uh, very similar. They have a similar thing, but they have a little, not all courses are accessible to them. They also have direct instruction in math, reading, and writing at their level, targeted level, through, in, through the Mason Life Program. So they all are receiving constant instruction each semester at their level in reading, math, and writing so that they are just still boosting those skills. If they're being successful with that, they're, they are encouraged to take courses at the University, George Mason, and then they have a list of about 150 courses that are appropriate for them, and they are paired with a mentor and offered support in those classes. Um, what's super cool about Mason Life is they have, a, uh, they have 12 students at every grade, so there's 48 students in this program. So they have a community that really works together as a community doing activities. They are part of Special Olympics for Fairfax, Virginia. So they have a Special Olympics team, but then they also are the coaches for the younger, stu younger kids in the community. They have um, peer mentors for studying. They also have supported internships. They learn, this is right outside of Washington, D.C., so they learn how to use the metro for Washington, D.C., and they do have um, jobs on Capitol Hill. And um, they are inclusively living in the dorms, again, with support. So all those life skills are happening there. Okay, um, I'm sorry. Why do these programs matter? So why, why should we care about these programs? I'm, I pretty much know you guys know, but I'm just gonna say it out loud. You're gonna have, if you attend these programs, that potential for you to have better jobs, uh, more civically engaged, because you're involved in your community, better relationships, um, potential for long-term romantic relationships, long-term friendships, better living. You're going to be able to navigate your community. If you have all those things, that leads to better physical health. So this actually is a, a health choice that we're making as a society in building these programs or not building them. Currently, 85% of people with intellectual disabilities are unemployed. And uh, actually our unemployment rate for the typical population is at right at around 4%. So 96% of people are employed except for 85% uh, of the population who have intellectual disabilities. We know that this population are fantastic workers. They're very honest. They show up on time. They do their jobs. They're very reliable. They're not going to be on their cell phones the whole time. They are devoted workers. So we know that these people, once they're given a job, the outcomes for them at their jobs are really great. We just have to convince uh, uh, companies to hire these people. How are they going to hire them if they're never seen, if they're not around? So having these students have internships, have job opportunities, through a university, again, puts them on the radar and gets them going. This is Patrick visiting the College of Charleston. So we went and visited it when he was a junior. I know the woman who founded it. She's a friend of mine. Her name is Cindy May. She's a professor there. So we weren't only just going to see the program. We were also going to go to Cindy's house after this thing and have dinner. So we started at 8 in the morning. First of all, we flew out, you know, rise up, Patrick, let's go. Started at 8 in the morning. It was a full day of, you know, we had like panel after panel, panel of students talking about the program, panel of professors talking about the program, panel of mentors talking about the program. Let's take a tour of the university. Let's go see a dorm. So by 5 o'clock, I was wiped out. <laughs> I was so tired. We get back to our hotel. I'm like, we don't have to go to dinner. Patrick, we could like fully hang out here. It's no problem. He was like, oh no, let's go to dinner. Sure. So we drove out, had dinner. He, I never know what to expect, but he rose to the occasion and he was pumped up. 
And at dinner, he was talking to two high school seniors who were typical, and they were doing the college talk, talking about, oh, I saw the dorm, oh, I saw this, I can do this, I'm, he's really interested in theater. He rose to the occasion. And I have to say that that has always been true in his life. Every opportunity that we've afforded him, I am always like, is this true? Is it right? But he rises. So then we have to do the application process. And I'm, again, not really sure. Does he want to do this? Is this just me? What does this look like? They're pretty involved. I mean, he has to sit down and type at the computer and answer questions. He needed some job or volunteering experience. He was, is really involved in theater. He loves doing plays. So he had helped at a camp. And he worked at a, a local snack bar for our city pool. So those were his jobs. He needed three letters of rec, but in addition, he needed a letter from the principal talking about his behavior. To, so, um, it's un, so there are extra things you're going to do rather than your typical student. He needed a full medical exam from his doctor and kind of a release that, that would be uh, possible for him to live without his mother present. Um, we needed hard copies so they were all, so his entire thing was mailed off into using the post office and that more, most college apps are digital. And then he had to answer the questions. Who are you? What are your goals? All of that. Um, but there he was, sitting at the computer doing it. And I was like, okay, I guess he wants to do this. So we just kept doing it. You know, I wasn't really sure. So then, um, then he, so we applied to three schools. We applied to Clemson, College of Charleston, and George Mason. He was denied at College of Charleston. He got two interviews, one at Clemson and one at George Mason. Clemson's interview was like an hour and a half long, just by himself, go in a room, talk to like a group of people in, a, in an office. George Mason's was all day long, nine to three. Um, he had to buy his own lunch, navigate the campus, do, I mean, of course, they met him, they supported him, but he was on his own. I was out of the thing. And again, I was like, can he do this? Is he going to do this? What does this look like? But he did. There he is. The guy just has no anxiety, as you can see. <laughs> there he is at Clemson. I'm like, can he do this? Is this okay? He's like, I'm like, can I take a picture? He's like, sure. <laughs> he flings over. I'm like, all right. Um, he just rose to the occasion again. He was excited because I think he had seen his big brother and sister. So this was exciting to him. Clemson has big football. My um, son went to USC. My daughter went to University of Oregon. So we know about big football. So he was like in the mode. But then there's so few spots. We really did not think he'd get accepted. I mean, so at, the, at George Mason University, there's 12 spots for freshmen. Two, so six guys, six girls. They set aside two spots for people with Down syndrome, two spots for people with autism, two spots for people with something else. So there were really only two spots for him at George Mason. Yeah, I mean, the odds are ridiculous. So we, we were like, well, we're going to have plan B. We called it Patrick's gap year because we thought we'd reapply, you know, and you'd get better. So what, so what was our plan B? So we had to consider his interests, um, are there any internships nearby, any local allies? There always are. There are people who want to help you. You just need to reach out. Patrick's really interested in theater, so we had some theaters that he could have been a part of that we know would have helped us with internships. Any cool community college classes? There were for him. Um, it, we hadn't really navigated the supports, but we know there would have been. Um, part-time jobs or job coaches, any nonprofit. So we started to kind of delve into what our plan B would look like. This is Patrick. Let's see if it'll work. Right? This is Patrick getting his letter. There you go. <clears throat> Wait, let me pause this for one second. Oops. Of course, as the universe goes, my husband and I weren't at home. <laughs> of course. Uh, we were down in LA for my husband had a big work thing that always coincides. That's how it always goes. So my big daughter, Mary Kate, uh, was living with us, applying to nursing schools. And so she's like, don't worry, 
I'll just video it and I'll put you on my cell phone and you on my laptop and you could all see it. So you'll see the two of us like weird, weird faces. That's why he's talking uh, to the computer. Right? Congratulations for your police to all the year and invitation to uh, to um M George Mason now program. Yeah. I am it! <laughs> yeah. Patrick, you're yeah. going to college! Yeah! I'm going to college! Check it out! Patrick, let me see. Are you excited? Yeah, I got in. Here, Patrick, can I see it? <laughs> That's so awesome, Patrick. <laughs> <laughs> so classic. It's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Patrick, put this in a special place. <laughs> that, my favorite is Caroline. Put it in a special place, Patrick. Um, so again, you go through this process, and I didn't know if he really wanted to go, really. I mean, we just kind of went through the process, but watching his reaction, it was like he really wants to do this. Uh, this th he is very into it. And um, so then my husband was like, dang, he's going to Virginia? Like, mm -hmm. what? And he had, my husband hadn't seen George Mason, and he was like, you know, if this doesn't feel right to me, he's not going. And I was like, that's fair. Like, you will go, and you have to feel really good about where he's going. Um, then we went to the orientation in June, and my husband bawled through every single meeting. And my husband's not a crier. But he couldn't get over these people who are dedicated to supporting your child's independence. It is the most unbelievable thing. And when it still chokes me up, my Patrick's been there since August 25th, when I consider how many people are working to help Patrick really live the adult life he's meant to live. It is so beautiful and exactly what we should be doing. So getting ready for college, I don't know the age of your children or where you're at, but Help your child develop independent living skills by leaving them unattended uh, when appropriate for short amounts of time in junior high and high school. Give them something to accomplish in that time so that you can, they will be proud of that time and they're not just wasting it watching YouTube or whatever. Help your child become technologically literate. Give them an iPhone. Give them email. Give them and Patrick happened to go to an amazing project-based learning tech-focused charter school. So he was, his school, his high school was helping him be technologically literate. He can text and navigate the, ma the maps and an email very well. And they, um, George Mason will teach you that too, but it's again skills that you can build at home. Why not do that? Build reading skills every day. If they can't read, audiobooks. Build literacy every day, all day. Teach the skill of follow through. So if your child wants something, whatever it is, have them work for it, follow through, and achieve it. That skill of follow through will help so much. Build writing skills. Make lists. Make Write notes. Write letters. Thank you notes. Whatever. Um, have a little fun back and forth journal if you want, funny thing. You know, you can start with pictures if you need to, but build writing schools. Use um, keyboarding and writing. If your child has difficulty writing, use technology to write, but definitely you can easily do like a personal blog that is so easy. You can take a photo each day and then on the blog type one or two sentences and have like a journal, an online journal for them that they can build and develop. But just build the writing skills. Give responsibility to your child. You know, start learning about laundry or pet sitting or cooking or shopping or paying for small items at stores. Patrick spent so much time learning money. It was nuts. I, looking back, should not have spent that much time on that. 
because he spent so much time on that, he did not feel confident doing the change, like going and shopping and getting change back every time. He would be just like, you do it, you do it, not wanting. So we got him his senior year a debit card. We taught him how to look you know, at how much he has each night, and that changed everything. And of course, I use my debit card for everything. Why did we spend so much time <laughs> making change with the quarters? It's so dumb. So, um, and then help your child picture the future and grow in awareness about what his or her disability is or what they need for their support. Have them leading their IEPs. Um, I'm thinking my next slide is this, yeah. So I want you to know about this book. Um, it's called The Congratulations Project. You can buy it in either hardcover or softcover. So if you have Down syndrome, you can attend a camp that's called Camp Pals. And the premise of the camp is you're paired as a young adult or a teenager, one person with Down syndrome to a typical person. And you live in a dorm on a college campus. And for a week, you do a bunch of fun activities. One of the Camp Pals is here at Santa Clara University. So they go to Google one of the days. They go to San Santa Cruz one of the days. They go to Giantscape. So they're doing all these super fun things. At the end of the week, the, student, the child with Down syndrome is asked to write a letter of congratulations to a new family that has a baby with Down syndrome. And they ask them, number one, what advice would you give to the new family? What is your life like right now, a day in your life? And what are you proud of? And the first year that Patrick did that, the first time he went to camp, he was 14. And um, he went to a camp. There's 10 camps around the country. He couldn't go to Santa Clara. He wasn't old enough. So we, we went to Chicago uh, at Elmhurst, one of those 16 programs. They have a camp. So he, when he's there, he's asked um, to write this letter. And he's like, I don't have Down syndrome. I don't have, you know, my days like your day. You know, and he had never considered what is it like to have Down syndrome? What, what are you proud of? No one had ever asked him. And his letter was junk, of course. So then the next year, when he had the chance, so he's gone for four years. Uh, the next year, it was, um, I have Down syndrome. You're going to like your baby. You know, like really, again, not much. Um, so he, they, this project, for four years, 45 minutes, I don't, that's all he did for four years, one 45-minute chunk. La last year's letter was so good it got included in this book. And what I love about this book is it's not the best handwriting, it's not the most, you'll see Patrick's handwriting isn't that great at all, um, but it's really it, what's powerful for teachers, so I want to share this with all teachers, all parents, all transition people who work in transition, because I want them to see that people who, Patrick's writing is pretty messy, but there, you'll see in this book, it's very diverse. There's incredible skills in writing and in abstract thinking and in ability to communicate. And then there's very, very simplistic, almost crude writing and very simple thoughts. But they're profound no matter what. They're moving no matter what. Asking someone, what are you proud of? What advice do you have to give? What is your day like is huge for everyone. We could ask kindergartners that, and it would be really profound. So his letter says, Dear parents, congratulations. My name is Patrick, and I'm proud of making friends and graduation from high school. In the future, I want to go to UC Davis and to be a director. There's no reason to be scared of having a kid with Down syndrome. As long as you love them, they will love you back. Good luck and have fun. Love, Patrick. So he moved all the way to self-love and pride just by having that opportunity four different times. And when he, now, his view of himself is, I do have Down syndrome, I do need support, and go out there and do, you know, let me do my stuff, I have stuff I wanna do. And so he, this is him at a book signing, so we had him do a book signing at the UC Davis Mind Institute, and um, he moved, I guess the best part that's not block, you can't be what you can't see. So you need to have young adults with disabilities out there sharing what their life is like, sharing what they're doing, 
sharing their passions. That needs to be a regular thing we see out there. So if you belong to a church, if you belong to a nonprofit that you're proud to belong to, if you belong to a, a club and you don't have people that have intellectual disabilities out there, go find them because they want to be part of it. Find them. We have to see these people living their life. Then one of my favorite phrases, hand the microphone to the marginalized. So Patrick, all last year, got up and started presenting with me. And I, w I was so out of my comfort zone. I was like, what? I had a friend who said, would you come and bring Patrick and talk, explain about applying to colleges? And I was like, what? I, I don't, we did, number one, we didn't even know. We were still applying. We didn't know any of the outcome. I'm like, what? Are you kidding? And she said, just bring him. It'll be fine. So she forced me out of my comfort zone. And when he took the microphone, I was, he was kryptonite to the audience. It was like, you know, and these were a bunch of transition people. It made the point so much better than I could ever make. And as a matter of fact, when I was talking to him yesterday, he's like, so are you going to, like, bring me in? Can I talk virtually to, like, FaceTime <laughs> the group? And I was like, um, I haven't talked to people about that, but I should. So I really have to get on that. But hand the microphone to them. Let people say their, their journey. Be a voter. Patrick is a voter. He voted in the midterms. He is voting uh, by mail. Um, he knows about it. He talks about it with us. Um, this is the freshman class of George Mason. Let me see. Can I make it bigger? No, I won't make it bigger. But you, you can come see it. But um, George Mason is very diverse, which is really awesome. My favorite is this gal. She's very, very quiet. Her name's Erica. She's got her fist up. It's like freedom. You know, she knows she's being given her freedom. And honestly, I believe these college programs are a path to freedom for our kids. Um, what can you do right this minute? Because I just told you in California we got nothing. If you went to a university, let your university know about inclusive post-secondary programs. Cut a check for a small amount and let them know you're donating it to their school of education to build a program. Money talks. People pay attention. Now, why do these programs matter? It's this thing called continuums of inclusion. So if you start at birth and preschool and you have an inclusive city that goes all the way through high school into college, you start having momentum for independent adulthood. You start having places to live, jobs that are appropriate, community involvement, opportunities for being part of, um, part of clubs or cool things. There's only four cities in our nation that offer preschool through college inclusion. None in the West, none in California. Now Davis, where I live, we're very inclusive school district. Preschool through high school, Full inclusive, awesome. So, but we're not a continuum. So what happens? We got that cliff. We need that college piece. So only four cities, who are they? They're Fairfax, Virginia, Providence, Rhode Island, Charleston, South Carolina, Nashville, Tennessee. They are the four. But there is no reason California can't have a bunch. You know, we, we have cities that are really inclusive. Berkeley is a classic example. Berkeley's very welcoming and diverse. They have preschool through high school, no college. So um, San Diego, again, has a lot of inclusion going. It's a nice little bubbling thing of inclusion, no college piece. So we have the cliff still. In Fairfax, their program, George Mason's program, is 16 years old. There are 10 homes that have been purchased right outside of George Mason University that are for the graduates. That people have said, the students don't want to leave. They find a community, they're part of a community, and they live there, they have their jobs there, and they now have a full little community growing. So when I called, when we were going to George Mason, um, the move-in day, 
was um, the 25th. And so we thought, we're from California. We don't know all the families. Let's have a dinner after move-in day for all the families, and we'll invite the faculty if they want to go. So it was like a dinner for, let's say, 50 people. So we started calling restaurants. Every restaurant was like, no problem. We know Mason Life. Can't wait. You know, we'll make you a special menu. We'll give you special food. We'll do these, all these special things. Because they're used to having these people in their community. They're a true continuum of inclusion. Just begin anywhere. <laughs> really, any tiny little thing, it matters. Um, what can you do right now? You can let your college know. Um, you can consider, I, I work for UC Davis, like I said. UC Davis is, we're going to build this program. Trust me, <laughs> it's coming. Um, my chancellor called for big ideas, um, so we're submitting our big idea. Yes? I'm wondering about that, because um, you said Fresno State has one. Can yes. The hang-up truly, I think, is unawareness. Okay. People just don't know what's possible. I work in all the high schools, so for us to go four years, it's really hard because we're not used to going to many of our courses. Right. I'm just trying to understand, like, you, know, you would have a separate application process. They do not graduate with a BA or BS, so it's a different um, amount of learning. Right now, these programs are so new that there's a whole group from Think College that's working to articulate so that everybody from all these programs comes out with the same degree or whatever it is. But right now, they're still building the plane as it's flying. So nothing's really formulated. So it, it is that they're not getting course credit um, in these programs unless <clears throat> they're fully taking it. Some kids at the College of Charleston are getting some course credit. But I feel like the UC and the CSU hang up is they just don't know about it. That's um, that because every, so in building the big idea that we're doing at UC Davis, we've gone to speak to deans. I've gone and undergrads have gone because the undergrads want this. This is what's super cool about the kids that are currently college age and high school age. They get inclusion. They want it. Typical kids want this. So I have undergrads knocking on the door of deans at dean of the med school, dean of the law school, dean of the business school at UC Davis saying, hey, why don't we have this? I really want this. I want to be a peer mentor. One of the undergrads wants to be a doctor. So she says, why, wouldn't it have been so great if in my undergrad I had lived with somebody who had an intellectual disability so that when I'm a doctor, I'd be able to really care for this population of people? You know, I want to be an OT or a PT or a teacher. Can you imagine our teachers, if they had been fully included in college? I mean, it's just life changing. A banker, you know, I can give a loan to somebody with an intellectual disability because I know they're capable and they will pay it back, right? Think of all the barriers our kids don't have because they haven't been allowed to be seen as full authentic members of our population. So it's truly transformative. I, when I was at so there is a really cool conference called the State of the Art Conference that is for all of the post-secondary programs in the nation. They all come together. Um, and it's coming. I've been hammering them. It's finally coming to the West Coast. They've had it for 10 years at George Mason University. George Mason is pretty much one of the best programs. So um, it finally went to Syracuse. Syracuse University has a program for two years. And now it's, I think, coming to Reno. Reno, Nevada is doing some good work. Reno and UNLV both have very good two-year programs. It's always inclusive living that seems to be the hump for a lot of these programs, which is why we're going to be building it at baseline four years with inclusive living. But um, at the State of the Art Conference, this guy who was a computer undergrad had made some apps for the, Clem he was a Clemson undergrad, had made some apps for the Clemson Life program. And he was sharing his app with about 150 people. And in the room, it was task analysis. It was like how to do shopping, all these different things. When he showed his app, we were just like, what? Everyone was freaking out. His app was so helpful to this population of people. Watching his face see the influence of his work as an undergrad made me, as a person at Davis, mad. It's like, we have a great computer science department. Here are people who are doing all this great work. They could see the importance, social justice importance of their work 
if we had an inclusive college program at Davis. We are cheating. In truth, your computer science students are not having as rich of an experience at Davis as they are at Clemson because of these opportunities. So we're truly cheating our typical students by not building these programs. So that's where people need to hear. That's what you know, deans and stuff need to hear. Partner with nonprofits. Offer community. If you have a business, offer an internship for people. Find a way to be an ally. Every one of us can do something. Um, this is Patrick and Caroline many years ago when they were, and it says, this is a quote from uh, Michael Phelps. There will be obstacles, there will be doubters, there will be mistakes, but with hard work, there are no limits. And um, I just really believe and thank you for your time and um, for you being here. And um, if you want to come, so I am hosting, not me, but UC Davis is partnering with Sac State, the Mind Institute, and the California State Department of Education Special Education Division to host a stakeholder meeting to envision four-year college programs with inclusive living, November 9th. My dean is paying for an amazing keynote speaker. His name is Eric Carter from Vanderbilt University. Vanderbilt has a program, um, and he will be coming out. So if you're interested in that, you can give me your email, and I will send you the link. It is purposely, intentionally free so that all stakeholders can come and no one will have a barrier to entry. So we'd love for families to come, nonprofits, anybody. If you're a teacher or superintendent, we don't care. We're all going to come together and learn about why we need these programs. So, yes? I, I have a question. I'm a special ed teacher and I currently teach high school students. Mm -hmm. And they always worry about high school. So how can I help them? You know, because some, I mean, I would say most of them, the parents are not as active as, right. you know, you were or some other parents. So how to motivate them and guide them and show them the... What's possible. Yeah, and then the other thing is also the financial yes. part of it. So yes, yes. I, I don't know how much is college. Yes. So, so um, while the community college programs in California, those 17, are very inexpensive, right? Okay. So, um, and... Um, Fresno State's program for two years is free because it's your paid for with your transition money. So it's free. So we can, the, the money is not really the issue. We have tons of federal money to build this. 15% of the state's VOC rehab money can be used to build these programs. And I really believe we can make the, the argument that let's just pretend Patrick was off the cliff and not doing anything. The state of California and the federal government is going to give him subsidized food, subsidized housing, subsidized health care. That's about 25 grand for 50 years of living. Let's just multiply 25 grand times 50. So it's smart on the front end to be fully funding this at the state level. So we can make the argument at the state level that we should be funding this for these students. Um, so I really believe, I mean, right now we're in a transition of changing to this mode. All these trends, so 2014 there was a, I don't know how much time I have. Yeah, uh, have. Okay. Um, in 2015, 14, there was a federal law that's called WIOA. Have you ever heard of that? W-I-O-A. That law um, was to make competitive integrated employment for people with, uh, in marginalized groups. So it's like foster kids, kids who've been incarcerated, kids who have intellectual disabilities, significant learning challenges. So that law was all marginalized kids. We need to find a way to get them competitive integrative employment. That allows, that law allows 15% of your state's VOC rehab money, which is millions and millions of dollars, to go to building these inclusive college programs. So we have, so the state of Georgia right now has five programs right now, seven more coming on by 2020 because they're using those federal funds to build it. Um, so what we have to do is again, we can't be what we can't see. So these students of yours need to see what's possible. They need to, I would bring in speakers 
to uh, people who have intellectual disabilities or significant learning disabilities into your school and who are going to college and let them hear what's, what they're doing and how they're learning. Okay. That's what I would do. And the same with parents. Um, do you have a list of those 17 colleges? Yeah, it's in, so did you, it's on the, it's, on, it's, a, it's a slide. Okay. okay. Yeah, it's on there. And you could use that slide. Okay. Um, I have cards, you can have my card. Um, you can have one of these for your um, students and your classroom. Anybody else a classroom teacher? You want one of these? Um, yeah, I'd love to get the word out that these people can have those. Oh, sorry. You guys don't need to see all this. Um, let me just hope that that, how about this? <laughs> um, and I can give you my card. Patrick had his class, um, he had um, a th his third grade teacher invite him back last year to talk to her third graders. She didn't have any kids with intellectual disabilities in her class. It was just her typical third grade class. So he came and talked about applying to college. And what was funny is they knew about Clemson because of the football, I guess. So all these third grade little boys were like, Clemson? You're playing to Clemson, it's amazing. Anyway, so then they would see me, like I'm not really around my daughter's school very much, she's a seventh grader, she's big now. Um, but they would, every so often they'd see me, these little third graders, did he get into Clemson? Is he going to Clemson? What's happening? You know, so again, just planting that seed, that someone with an intellectual disability can apply to Clemson and third graders, I mean that, those third graders now are forever changed just by that 20 minute conversation. So we have to. Um, oh, I have a safe card. Oh, <laughs> see, where's what's your name? Amina. Amina, we're supposed to be friends. I love it. Yeah. Share with me. Um, I love that. So um, anyway, I I just feel like people need to know what's possible, and um, let me just tell you about his fr this freshman year part now for Patrick. Uh, that is so cool, Amina. Um, so we dropped him off in August. He lives with four, so three other people in a typical dorm. Two of the people have disabilities. One has autism. One ha is so he's a junior. One has Down syndrome and OCD. He's a senior, and then he lives with a mechanical engineering senior, typical guy. So he's like the RA for the three of them. Um, so he lives in the dorm with all all the other kids, and um, he is responsible for making his dinner three nights a week, way more than my kids, who, my typical kids who were freshmen in college, they just went to the dining commons three times a week. He has to make his dinner three times a week, so he goes shopping and budgets and makes a dinner, and then he has to make his lunch four times a week. Again, shopping and planning for that. He has, you know, his dorm room is way cleaner than Jack or Mary Cates was because he has some chores that he's responsible for. He happens to live, the guy who he lives with um, is incredibly clean. So poor Patrick has not had to do much cleaning because this other guy is incredibly clean. But um, he, you know, get the senior who he lives with, when he was freshman, you know, in his first week was like, well, I know where we're going on campus. I'll take you. You have to be there at nine. It takes 15 minutes to walk. You know, so the senior had a chance to mentor Patrick. And he did. Patrick's never been late because he has this senior roommate who's guiding him. Um, he, so, and then all these other kids. So once um, every day, Monday through Friday at 4 p.m., there's some sort of campus activity, so some campus club that has agreed to reach out to these Mason Life students. So on Mondays, it's the fraternity Pike. Every Monday from 4 to 5, Pike comes and does some activity. Usually it's some sort of um, workout thing. Um, Tuesday, they have the Taekwondo club who comes. Um, Wednesday, it's um, some art club who comes. So again, bringing all those typical kids in to meet this population of a student and get, creating friendships. Um, 
for the first time ever in Patrick's life, he said, I'm having a Halloween party in my dorm room. So I need, I'm, I, so I want candy, and I want like goldfish crackers, and I want da 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 da. And he, and then he said, and I'm going to invite X X X X person. He has a community that he can do that with. So it's just absolutely incredible to see that he takes a class on sexual health. So he has a rubber right on his desk. Um, he knows about self-regulation. He takes a class on self-regulation. He takes a class on mental health and wellness. He takes a class on um, budgeting. Um, he's learning how to use the Metro right now. So he has a, a partner who's teaching him how to access the, uh, the DC Metro. Um, if he wants to go off campus, he has to make a plan and he has to present his plan to his RA. His name is Stav. Stav has to get approval. So his, if I'm going off campus, where am I going? <clears throat> How far away is it? How long is it going to take me? What am I going to do? Will it cost money? How am I getting home? Is the place, the ride I'm getting, does that end at a certain time? If so, like um, let's say I want to go to the movies. You know, when does my movie end and will my ride be available? All of that planning is in context and meaningful. Right now, he does have a curfew that's 10, and it increases by a half hour uh, each time he meets a certain amount of check, you know, checkpoints. So it's very um, supported, but also building the skills to really live independently. Yeah. So, yeah. So right now, <coughs> yeah. Oh, uh-huh. Could you repeat the question because they can't hear Sure. So the question is, what kind of degree is he um, obtaining at the end of these four years? So right now, uh, these TIPSIDs, these federal grant monies, and these programs are all very new. Um, George Mason's is probably the oldest at 16 years old. Most of them are about eight years old because 2010 was the first TIPSID grants. So they do not have, so each school has their own thing they're graduating with, and they, there's no real articulation across programs. So Think College, that big clearinghouse, is right now building the articulation and accreditation process. So there's no, so I don't have a good like, oh, they get a Bachelor's of Science, because it's not there yet. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, they would be able to do that. Yes. Right? So, so this in, at George Mason, the first semester is entirely just adjusting to living away from home. <clears throat> and then, and taking those, I told you they take really intensive reading, math, and writing at their level, small groups. So then six weeks into school, we met. So I flew out there and met for a person-centered plan. And we had... Stav, the guy who lives with him. We had the internship person. We had the, the person who does the George Mason courses. We had the people who do the, the Mason Life courses. And I think that's it. <clears throat> so those academic people shared how Patrick was doing. And they really, they said, and I thought it was so fascinating, because they, they have a lot of students who've never been fully included. They were segregated the whole way. So they said, because Patrick's been fully included, we can tell he's a strong student and we, he's ready to take some courses at George Mason. And let's talk about which courses. So that was when they talked to Patrick, what are your interests? What do you want to study? His interest is direct, moving, I want to be a movie director is what he'll tell you. Mm -hmm. And so he, they said, okay, theater, we have video, we have media, we have theater here. And then the internship woman said, you know, you need to be a good communicator if you're going to be a director, so I think you should take some communication classes. Um, and then you maybe want to do Toastmasters as a club because that would practice your um, skill in communicating. So listening, I mean, it chokes me up so much. Listening to, the, so that person-centered plan was like an IEP with none of the junk. Mm -hmm. It was like, we're not going to tell you how disabled your kid is, and here are the 17 tests that show you how disabled your kid is. That whole piece was gone. 
It was just about where are you right now and where do you want to go and we're all here and let's figure out how to do it. And they all did that. So I expected when he said movie director, them to be like, <laughs> cute, you know, like, I want to play professional baseball, right? Some other 19-year-old might say, ha ha, cute. You know, but no, they were like, all right, this is where you want to go. So they're really understanding real freedom of the individual and not limiting his um, dreams or his vision. And they, you know, he'll have internships and he'll have these opportunities and he'll refine that dream like we all do as we go through our life. And that was what was so profound, was that. You know, we're gonna take you at your dream and we're gonna start supporting you and then you'll, next year at the person-centered plan, you'll have another next step forward and we'll refine it. It's amazing, yeah. And I literally couldn't stop bawling because I know so many kids Patrick's age here in California who are not having this opportunity not because they're not capable or could rise to the occasion and do this, because it's not here for them. Because we don't even know to build it. So we have to all just build it and make it happen. Um, because it's, it's a disservice. We're harming all of, our, all of our kids right now who are college age that are attending California colleges with none of these students on their campus. We're harming them all. And we really have to make it a priority. So, so that so join me, help me, get that done. Yeah. Uh, can you apply for the scholarships? Um, there are so all all scholarships that are federal or state, Cal State, all apply to Patrick. So he could apply. He didn't um, apply for any scholarships, but he could have. Um, Cal grants, Pell grants, all of that apply. So, yeah, which is very cool. There's also a special scholarship called um, Ruby's Rainbow. Have you ever heard of this? Mm -hmm. No, it's so cool. So this woman um, who has a daughter named Ruby, she created a, scholarship, a college scholarship for people with Down syndrome. And she has been fundraising ever since Ruby was a baby. Ruby's now about eight. So she is so great, of course. It kind of correlated right as these programs were coming on because um, it's been going about eight years. So she gives away hundreds of thousands of dollars in scholarships to these students all over the nation. Uh, so there are scholarships available. Ruby's Rainbow. Yeah, it's really cute. Um, any other questions? No? Young men with Down syndrome and two for young women. Okay. So four. Um, do you get a sense of like how competitive? Yeah, it's crazy competitive. Like how many? How many? Um, I don't know. They wouldn't. George Mason wouldn't tell me how many applied, and I actually I didn't ask. But I have a friend whose daughter has Down syndrome who applied to U Utah State has a program. So it's a two-year program, and it does have living, inclusive living. So she applied to that program. She has Down syndrome, 137 applicants for eight spots. She got one. Yeah, but look at 100 and all, the, over 100 kids didn't. And they still need a place to go. I mean, you know, we, when, if you don't get into a college in California and you're a typical kid, you can still go to your community college, right? I mean, you have options. There's nothing for you, so. Yeah, I think a lot of it is um, are basically, um, are they going to behave? Are they going to have a lot of behaviors that might be very difficult? Although, I, I will tell you, they don't take the most behaved kids. It's just that, will they, are the kids workable? Will they, are they coachable, right? Are they going to be accepting feedback and working with you? Um, kids who would feel co comfortable leaving their family. That's a huge piece of it. Um, and that's why I feel like unintentionally, like so much of what we did was unintentional, but Patrick going away to camp for those years, 
helped him know he could be away from us and it was going to be okay. And there were people who would support him. Um, our, I think, I think um, if you've had ability to work with others would be a good quality. Um, they do have, each program has a list of things they're looking for so you can see it on there. Um, they, George Mason accepted a student that has seizures um, and he has a dog with seizure, uh, seizure like reminder, a dog that can sense the seizure and yeah. warn him. Um, and he had a seizure on campus. And um, what was so profound about George Mason's life program is all those supports were in place. So the RA who lives with him knew what to do. The, the, there's a person that's, they have like a group text that you can group text at any time. All of the people were aware. They got him the medical help he needed. He had to be in the hospital for a few days because it was a big one. And then he went right back to his workplace and did his stuff. So imagine being afforded these opportunities when you do have, you need significant support. It's pretty incredible. So it's not like they're taking the least involved kids or the kids who need the least support. Really, no. They're accepting kids who need a lot of support and they don't mind giving it. So, yeah. Do you know what the program is called in Fresno? Um, Wayfinders. Wayfinders. Yeah. And she's awesome. Shale Lopez, Lopez Ortiz is her name. She's really fantastic. Builds a great program. Mm -hmm. And their dorms are beautiful where they live, yeah. The reason we didn't really look at, you guys should definitely go there and check it out, yeah. Um, the reason we didn't go there is because the theater wasn't inclusive. Mm -hmm. And so for Patrick, that's gonna be such a big part of his college experience, it felt so crummy to be like, I can't send you to college and not get you to do theater. Mm -hmm. um, so that is the reason why we went and visited it and it's really great, um, but that's, that was a bummer for us. Our particular need wouldn't have been met there, you know. But it's the people I know who've gone there. I know a lot of kids who've gone there. It's been fantastic. Yeah. Yes. So, so it's a free, free tuition for two years. Yeah, and it's only a two-year program. Okay. So then they're done. Yeah. And what's the name of the person you saw? Shale, S H A I L Lopez, Dash Ortiz. And definitely take tours, it's great. Okay. It'd be really great um, for you to see it. We have about 15 minutes. Okay. Um, there are a couple questions. Oh, great. Uh -huh. from, uh, remote participants, if you want to read those. Okay, awesome. Okay, it says, I understand the community colleges in California have a department for guidance and assistance for college students with disabilities. Is this something you're aware of? And what do you know about the UCLA program? Okay. So the, um, there are, I do not know how, I'm sure, I'm assuming that the 15 college programs that are at um, community colleges here in California are probably housed under um, College of Students with, Dis Students with Disabilities and supported that way. Um, Here's my feeling about community college programs. I feel like they offer fantastic opportunities for all kids. My problem is people with disabilities, especially intellectual disabilities, are marginalized already. They're off to the side already. Going to a community college, you'll just be off to the side for the whole experience. And um, that is what I'm trying to break down. I, I want, so if the community college, so there's a fantastic community college up in, or in Washington called Highline Community College. They're, they are inclusive. They're fantastic. They have built inclusive living. They have done a lot of stuff. That is building community and then building these opportunities. And then because they've done that, they have a lot of internships and job opportunities and things going. If that's happening at your community college, that's fantastic. But for so many kids who are going to community college, they're just in and out. They're taking their class, and then they're off campus back to their job or whatever they're doing. And so the campus itself 
isn't a community and it's just meeting your individual needs and heading out. I believe this, this population of student, more than almost any other one, needs a community to have these opportunities to amplify their opportunities for jobs and living after college. Um, the UCLA program was one of the very first programs. It's operated out of UCLA. It's an extension. It's called Pathways. So you, you apply through UCLA Extension. It's a two-year program. It does have inclusive living. But because it's offered through Extension, it's very segregated. And in 10 years' time, watching what has happened at UCLA, if you could see what's happening, so College of Charleston, 10 years old, their program. Every single, every single um, professor on that campus is, accepts um, students that are in the College of Charleston REACH program. That is not what has evolved over time. So in my mind, and I'm sure the people at UCLA are doing their best, but it has not grown. It has not gained momentum. It is still off to the side through extension. It hasn't developed into a four-year program. Some of these programs that started as two years have now evolved into four years. It hasn't done that. I think it might be trying. So again, I don't want to diss anybody who's trying to do this because I'm excited anybody's trying to do this. But you've had a decade to grow your program. And I think it's just not connecting. We have this state-of-the-art conference. I went to the state-of-the-art conference as a parent. The only people from California that were there was Fresno. Fresno was there, getting better, learning. Because what happens, they all share their curriculums they're building. So like the sexual health curriculum that Patrick's taking at George Mason was developed out of the University of Iowa's program. University of Hawaii has all this amazing data capture that they're doing. So they, when you attend that conference, you start sharing best practices and what's working. And UCLA, I, I attended that conference for two years. I never saw them either year. Um, so I just feel like they're probably doing their thing and they're happy with what they're doing and it's, it's good, but it's, again, very few students and not nearly enough. And we could be doing a lot more. I work in a culturally diverse classroom. The norm is the students are at home with the family instead of leaving home. Yes. Do you have any advice or experience with this? Yes. I think this is a real thing for all students. Um, I feel like that's a family choice. And we have to honor that and respect it. And that's great. Um, however, there, at some point, you would hope that you're, I, I would think that at some point you might want your child to live independently. If you don't want your child to live independently and you're having them at home with you, you know, through their young adulthood, then that's, that will be what it is. Then they will live with you and they'll live with family members and they'll be supported through their family. Um, I feel like families who, who are very, um, who have the cultural norm of living together in their young adulthood, when their child with a disability, let's say, reaches the age of 30, and would maybe potentially want to move out, they haven't developed those skills to do that. So I think, it, again, it's a, maybe a safety issue. It might be a cultural issue. Just letting these families know that these programs exist and that um, all cultural norms are respected and honored within these programs. George Mason, you, don't, you do not have to live on campus. You can live with your family and attend George Mason. That's a choice that families make to live on campus. So I feel like there are programs, the 16 that offer the four years, would respect if you wanted to live with your family during those four years. So. I definitely don't think that that has to be some, a reason you don't participate in the program. Any other thoughts or thinking? Do you want to tell me what you guys do? I'm sure there's a ton of expertise in here. I'd love to know it. What do you guys, what do you do? Um, I just recently transitioned from being in a program for high school special ed to a preschool program, and now I'm an administrative assistant. At a district? In, in or? Okay, awesome. Yes. Okay, so I'm great. I'm very interested in the cliff that occurs at age five, even. Yes. Because yeah. um, we've done some creative things in preschool to foster inclusion 
Mm -hmm. But now my role is to come in and support all of the mod peer programs K-12. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How do we build good programming in the first place? And right. How do we build it to be inclusive? Right. Yeah. And um, so that when they get to, I know there's the eventual flip. The yeah. Big one, the big one. We're already building towards more independence. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm kind of at the opposite end of mm -hmm. where you are, but I'm interested in getting yeah. closing the gap. Totally. Um, I will definitely, if any of you want to attend the stakeholder yeah, meeting, um, just that. give me your email. You got, I'll just, why don't you just put your emails sure. on this card and then I'll send you. Sure. Um, I, I do feel like uh, there is a cliff at age five, which is exactly what you said, that a lot of families don't even know is coming. So they just fall off the cliff unintentionally. Um, and we need to do a better job of helping. So I... I told you I run a nonprofit that helps Catholic schools be inclusive. On our website, we have research, the 30 years, 40 years of educational research that supports inclusion. We also have the research that shows the harmful effects of segregation. Anybody can access that research and share it with any educator anytime. But we parents trust the system. They feel like, well, I don't know about teaching. I'm not a teacher. You guys do. I trust you. But we know that starting preschool fully included in a preschool setting is a best practice for all learners, every single student. That is a mandate from the federal government. So the federal government has said, we actually have that mandate on our website too, the federal government has said all federal preschools have to be inclusive. So if we, but what happens is these kids with identified disabilities at age three, they go into a special ed preschool. And then because they're in the special ed preschool, this, the setting, their least restrictive setting is segregated. And so they get shoved into a segregated kinder. Unintentionally. We have to break that down. And parents don't know to even ask. Again, we can't be what we can't see. They don't know. So we as educators have to let them know that number one, our federal government has mandated that all preschools should be inclusive. Your child with a disability should be included in a fully inclusive preschool. And that, if you are, that is your least restrictive environment when you transition to K. What do you do? So I work for a city. I'm a recreation therapist. I work for a city. Oh. I supervise our therapeutic recreation program. Awesome. As well as our inclus inclusive program for our whole division. Awesome. So I train all the um, casual staff, the day camp staff, the aquatic staff, and oh. their supervisors on inclusion, um, disability awareness, behavior management. What's your city? The uh, city of Sunnyvale. Yay, <laughs> Sunnyvale. Good for you. So glad to see you there. Thank you. Awesome. What's your job? Yes. Uh, and I try to do some program associate work, but primarily I work with like entrance referrals. So okay. We talked about taking like OSA role and going back into our schools and supporting before they get to that NPS referral. So nice. and when I'm sitting at um, the diocese at the NPS, I I haven't heard a lot of talk about um, outside of like you know the community you know practices they do anything about schooling afterwards. So that's Okay, I hope it met some of your yeah. needs. I'm a uh, resource specialist for Gilroy Unified School District. So glad you're here. Thank, Thank you. you. I'm a program specialist for the elementary schools in Piedmont. Awesome. So glad you're here. Have a book. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Um, I work here for the county uh, for the Head Start program. I supervise two site, two school, and their full inclusion site. Awesome. So the Wool Creek site and Tamarack. Awesome. So here through Santa Clara? Yes. Um, nice. Okay. Wonderful. Yeah, I'm the same role as Carl. Okay. I'm site director for the uh, Ulao site under Evergreen School District. Evergreen School District. Yes, I know that district. Yeah. 
Um, I'm a special education director for a small our school in Sonora. Oh, and, awesome. Um, our special ed, I've been there for four years. In the four years that I've been there, our special ed population has quadrupled. Wow. Because um, we have full inclusion for all of our special ed students. And we offer a program, a unique, specialized, individualized program that no other school in our area provides. Wow. Um, and I'm currently just hired an assistant from Maine. Um, and I'm currently working only with high school students right now. And you're a and charter. I, Charter High School? Yes, and I have 28. Nice. How, um, but your high school is 9 through 12? Well, no, we're K-12. Oh, you're K-12 Charter. We're K-12. Oh, um, awesome. And I used to have both schools, because we have two schools. And, um, but now I just have the one. Um, I just okay. hired somebody to help me at the other site, the K-8. And so I just have high school right now. Very I'm cool. I'm supervising uh, some person at the other school. But I have 28 in high school right now with varying needs and right. um, whatever. And so who have big pretty dreams. pretty exciting. Yeah, it is. Well, thank you for your work. Yes. I'm a program specialist. I actually work in the very same region, um, Tuolumne County Superintendent of Schools. Nice. Um, and so we support the 11 districts, including um, the, that charter district. Um, and I'm brand new to, um, to, the, to the area and to my particular role as administrator, but I oversee the Madras Severe County operated programs mm -hmm. as well as the transition program. Okay, well, you need a book too. And we are happy to have her here. I bet. I bet. Yeah. Um, we, we're part of, um, we're newly, within maybe two weeks or so, part of the supporting inclusive practices. Oh, nice. Yay. So we have identified two schools that are. Um, that was my first that we're going to pilot. Okay, good. Uh, Congratulations. That's districts. very cool. Yeah. yeah. What are your districts? Uh, Soulsbyville Elementary Dawn District. Soulsbyville, uh-huh. And, and then, um, that one was chosen because we have three Montessori classrooms in Soulsbyville. Yeah. 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 Y